Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third day of our VBS Technology Conference. I'm Mark Choker, and I'll be your host today. If you joined our previous session, you will already know how the system called Demio works. On the right side, you see a chat panel. It is important to understand that all chat messages are private and only seen by our moderators. Throughout the presentation, please ask any questions in there, and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end of the session. What you're going to hear and see today are some highlights of the BSM technology from an integrator perspective. This session is really targeted towards integrating integration engineers, but if I were to highlight the key takeaways we hope you get from this session, I would say there are two. Firstly, our technology is very complete. We have broad and deep SDKs. We have lots and lots of content and capabilities already included in the product. And we have tools available to interact with our technology at every level. And secondly, what this means is that any engineer can pick up our technology and build a new training system quickly and cost effectively. Obviously, this is especially true for defense projects because they are already the main focus of our products. So if you're considering a new technology platform, we hope we can convince you that we at BSM have a lot to offer. So let's start to dive right in by introducing my co-hosts. So with me today are Ryan, the development lead of the SDK, waving now, Julian, head of tools development, right there, and Tim, our XR expert covering virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. I will now hand over to Ryan and kick off the session. So uh, we're going to be uh, giving a, an overview, like Mark said, of the VBS SDKs and what we have to offer. So uh, to start with, uh, we'll, I'll give a, a pretty broad introduction to what the SDKs are, why we should use them, and how they work. Um, we'll get into a few demos. So we'll first look at Gear Studio. Um, we'll look at uh, creating an example custom sensor for VBS Blue IG. And uh, we'll have a demo of uh, integrating an external simulation called PedSim with VBS4. We'll have some videos of our XR, uh, which is our AR, VR, MR capabilities. We'll talk briefly about the SDK examples and our improved content workflow. Uh, to start with, um, why use SDKs? So uh, VBS4 and VBS Blue IG, we already have some very powerful uh, interfaces for integrators. Uh, you may already be familiar with SIGI if you're working with IGs. Uh, or if you're an experienced VBS user, you may have used uh, SQF scripting. Those are, of course, already available uh, and still available in VBS Blue IG and VBS4. However, these interfaces are not sufficient for deeper integrations. For example, you may need to have direct access to the simulation engine or the rendering pipeline. Uh, you may need to integrate with motion trackers or VR devices. So importantly, an SDK is going to provide you a high performance direct API calls without the overhead of a scripting engine. Next, uh, I'll talk about what are the SDKs. So the primary goal of the SDKs is to extend the capabilities of VBS and VBS Blue IG. So you could do things like query information about the simulation, take control of entities and animations, and replace or enhance built-in functionality. We have two SDKs that we offer. Uh, the first of which is VBS Simulation SDK. This is for use with VBS 3 and VBS 4. Uh, and like the name suggests, these APIs available in this SDK are for interacting with the simulation. We also have VBS IG SDK, which is for use with VBS Blue IG. And these APIs are focused on manipulating the visual scene, which is the primary uh, use case for an IG. So, it's important to note that most of the capabilities of our SDKs are actually shared. The BSIG SDK and VBS Simulation SDK are deliberately designed to share most of their common functionality, such that if you know how to work with one, you know how to work with the other. Uh, for example, both SDKs offer the same APIs for querying for collisions, controlling weapon fire, environment, uh, 2D and 3D rendering, and doing things like skeletal animation. Additionally, there's lots of other uh, capabilities involving lighting, damage, particle effects, et cetera, uh, which are common to both SDKs. But if we look at, for example, VBS IG SDK and how it differs from VBS Simulation SDK, we can see what the differences are. Uh, on VBS IG SDK, we have APIs for creating custom sensors. 
We also have APIs uh, for integrating with XR and trackers. We have complex symbology, uh, which can be three-dimensional, and we have multiple viewports. Additionally, we provide the ability for integrators to hook into the SIGI implementation, thermal control, and so forth. On VBS simulation SDK, on the other side, we are focusing on simulation and the virtual desktop trainer element of it. So we have, of course, AI control over AI behaviors, as well as the mission and scenario and AAR, as well as the ability to build custom HTML5 UI overlays, which can be interacted with by uh, users of the trainer. Uh, before we get too much further in discussing our SDKs, I have to introduce the concept of gears. So all VBS products and SDKs are built around gears, which is an open standard modular component architecture. Uh, Gears components are the primary piece of the Gears architecture, and they encapsulate subsystems of related functionality. These plug into products built on Gears, as all of our VBS products are built on Gears. So Gears APIs provide a well-defined interface between these components. So each of these interfaces is C language compatible, so you could use any standard C compiler. You're not locked into any specific version of Visual Studio, for example, or you might choose to use something else. Additionally, Gears allows these APIs to be fully versioned for future compatibility. And I'll touch on this uh, briefly when I do the demo of Gears Studio. So adding on to this, VBS SDK APIs leverage the power of Gears. They are high performance, low level C language interfaces as opposed to a script parsing based interface. They're fully versioned and tightly encapsulated. What this means to uh, VBS SDK developers is that there is no recompilation required each time we release a new version of uh, our VBS runtimes. And additionally, most uh, APIs are compatible with future versions of VBS. So that simplifies the developer workflow greatly. Additionally, we can support other languages as well, such as C-sharp or Python. Uh, the main way uh, customers interact with Gear Studio and the way that we interact internally is by a product called Gear Studio. Gear Studio is an optional program that is included with VBS Simulation SDK and VBS IG SDK. It's also available for free to, to the community. There's a community edition. Uh, and it supports Visual Studio 2010 and later and it basically simplifies the component generation of Gears components. Uh, it generates code and uh, helps you work in the Gears ecosystem, and I'll be showing a demonstration of it. So in this demo, we're going to go over some of the basic uh, elements of component creation uh, and how the code generation works. So to start with, this is the Gears Studio interface, and we're going to be creating what's called a Gears product. Uh, the Gears product is basically analogous to a solution in Visual Studio. So here I'm choosing the directory I would like the binaries to be built into. And now I'll select which SDK I would like to target. You notice I can choose any of the SDKs there. So in this case, I'm going to target simulation SDK for VBS3. Here I have my empty Gears product. And I'm going to go ahead and create a Gears component within it. Uh, notice that the interface here is very simple wizard based interface. I could just give my component a name and click next. In most of these cases, I can take the defaults. In this case, I'm going to select API helper where gears will automatically generate code to help me interact with the system. I'll turn off source control here since this is just a demonstration. And here I will begin adding APIs. Now these are commonly known as listener APIs or events. So in this case, I'm searching through the APIs available in SDK. In this case, I'm adding application listener, which is quite important. It gives us callbacks on uh, events related to the simulation. As well as uh, we were building a VBS3 plugin, so we also care about events related to the mission. So I'm searching for the mission listener API. I'm going to add that. So in this case, I'm going to be getting events related to that. Now we'll look at dependencies, which are APIs that I'm going to interact with. So the primary one in both SDKs is the world API. That's how we create uh, all entities in the simulation. So we add that. And we'll also add the log API for some basic uh, logging capability. So next, there is an ability to create APIs, but we'll go over that in a little bit. So we'll go ahead and create our component. And Gears will get started on generating the code for us. This takes just a moment. 
And as soon as that's done, we'll be able to right click and pop open the code editor. And that's going to take us directly into Visual Studio. Note I could configure any version of Visual Studio I want there. Um, in this case, these product these projects in here have been automatically generated by Gears, and I have all of the basic uh, bones of a Gears component generated for me without me having to take any specific action. Notably, I have the application listener and the mission listener that I added. Uh, Gears has automatically generated stubs for me so that I can just start coding right away. Additionally, it's created this file called gears.h, which I can use, and gears.h is going to list all the APIs that I would interact with and their version number. So the version number is a, is a key component of this uh, because if, for example, we were to come out with a newer version of any of these APIs, uh, my code is still fixed to that version and would continue to work even if I needed to recompile against a future SDK. So I can get started uh, here typing some basic um, commands and you'll see that the IntelliSense is going to show me the functions that I would have available on World API. Uh, these are automatically generated uh, by Gear Studio. And uh, note as I do this that uh, the version of the API is embedded in the actual text of what I'm coding. So that's just another safeguard that we're making to ensure that when these components are compiled against future SDKs, they work just fine. So I'll create a camera. It's very simple, very simple a little code example here. And as I'm doing this, I realize uh, I forgot an API. I'm going to need the camera aspect API to deal with the camera. So I can come back to Gear Studio. I can just go back to dependencies, and I can now search for camera here. So we'll do the search. There's the API I want. I'll click Add. Actually, I misclicked here. I need to uh, click Add and then click Generate. So uh, we'll add and generate. And we'll come back to Visual Studio in just a moment. And what we'll see is that even though I was already editing and the file being partially, partially auto-generated, uh, the code that I already had was not overwritten. So that's important. Uh, you know, This code generation does not get in your way. It's pretty smart about it. So after uh, I've added that, now I can come down to the next line here, and I should find that the uh, camera aspect API is now available as I would expect. And I could do something with that, for example, like set the sensor mode on the camera that I would want to operate on. So I could do that. Uh, now let's say I wanted to, for example, create a Gears API. Now maybe I would like to have two Gears components uh, in my solution and they would work together with each other. So I could take advantage of the Gears ecosystem myself by creating a Gears API. So the way to do that is actually very easy. We'll go back to Gears Studio, we'll do a created API, and within this API, We'll just call it a demo function uh, API, for example. And we'll give it the name and we'll click create. That will take us into the API creation wizard. And I've kind of got like the bones of a header file here. So let's say my API that I'm going to create is going to depend on the world API because I'm going to be using some of the primitives that are available in there. So I'll go ahead and add that. Now I'll add a function. You see Gear Studio has automatically generated a, a little bit of code for me and it's automatically checking my code for errors and, and typos. And so it's basically saying, hey, you need to give this a proper name. It's also warning me if I've forgotten to put a description and things like this. So it's very helpful to, uh, to work with it in this fashion. So in this case, I'm creating some function. It's going to take an object. Gear Studio wants me to know that I need to declare this as an input parameter and that I should give these uh, functions uh, some description. So we'll go ahead and do that just now. And as soon as we finish doing that, we will generate once more. And as we generate, uh, Gear Studio is going to create an API header file for that and we'll reload our solution. Again, we haven't lost any code we've written, but now I have this demo function api.h, which Gear Studio generated, so we'll come into that. We'll note that uh, those comments I entered in Gear Studio are available there, and I have my sum function. Additionally, if I go down to the end of the, the file here, I'll see that I have a stub uh, function available for, for demo function. Now, 
Uh, let's say that I would like to create a new version of my API. So I've wanted to enhance it. We've come up with some new uh, functionality and I need to add a parameter. Now, ordinarily, this would actually cause a problem because I would break compatibility with existing users of my Gears API. Uh, but Gears is a fully versioned API system. So by creating version two here, I can go ahead and add this in 32 sum value. We'll just resolve the, the warnings there. And what this is going to do is create a second version of my API. In fact, this is how internally we handle versioning in SDK in order that we don't break existing code. So as I cl create uh, click generate, Gears will actually go update that uh, function that I've already created. And now we can see that I have some function and some for function version two. Uh, so the existing implementation of some function is not disturbed and the new version is available. And I can see Gears uh, has indicated that we've updated the sum function in version two and that there's a new implementation available. So this is something that you can do to uh, really ease the component generation workflow and API generation workflow. And we'll go back, okay. So moving on from that, I'll, I should mention that uh, to reiterate, VBS products are built on the Gears infrastructure. They're built on the Gears architecture. So many of the internal components uh, that you would interact with in VBS4 and BlueIG are actually built using our own SDKs. Uh, for example, VBS Plan and VBS Geo are built on technology that uh, comes from the VBS simulation SDK. And the SIGI implementation on VBS Blue IG is built on the VBS IG SDK, as well as many customer components can plug into those same interfaces. So those use this high speed uh, direct function calls through the Gears interface and to the simulation SDK, as opposed to, for example, the VBS scripting interface, which is a low speed scripting interface, which is based on string and script parsing. Uh, just to amplify that a little bit, on the left, we have a screenshot of VBS Geo here. Uh, and on the right, we have a screenshot of VBS plan. Uh, on the left, we have some uh, terrain clamped drawing that's being done. That green circle is clamped to the terrain and we have the, the little object picker that's uh, above the house there that's using the screen and world drawing APIs from VBS simulation SDK. And over on the right, the entire user interface of VBS plan, for example, is built using our HTML5 UI overlay uh, APIs within VBS. Uh, now, briefly, I'll mention uh, the SDK architecture. It's actually very simple to understand. There's two main ways to interact that are familiar to any developers of any other APIs. We have direct API calls. Uh, these are just normal function calls, very easy to use. We also support what we call listeners, uh, also known as events and many other APIs. Uh, we saw those in the Gears example I showed where I looked at mission listener, for example. Uh, again, the architecture is simple. It's built around the concept of objects and aspects. So objects represent entities in VBS, such as soldiers, tanks, uh, cameras in this case, and aspects represent their properties. So any object which would be movable would have, for example, the transformation aspect. So all three objects in this example have the transformation aspect, but only the camera would have the camera aspect. And for example, the soldier would have the lifeform aspect. Uh, Next uh, brief demo I'm going to give is uh, of the IGSDK sensor API. So uh, VBS IGSDK provides uh, customers with the ability to um, create their own custom sensors. Indeed, all of the sensors that ship with VBS Blue IG are already built using the same technology. So this sensor API provides access to a wide variety of material lighting and rendering data at a very low level within the VBS Blue engine. Uh, custom sensors are made uh, available for use on any IG camera. And uh, for example, uh, if you were to create a custom sensor using this API, it would work with a SIGI host. On the bottom right, we have a, a little diagram here of the types of information that's available. We have uh, normal X and Y, infrared, sun, internal heat, material ID, lighting, albedo, and atmospheric effects available. Uh, within the VBS IG SDK, we ship an example uh, called the Material Highlight Sensor, and it combines some of these various uh, data types uh, into a final output. So in the, in the lower right, you can see that there's a little helicopter which is highlighted, uh, and which we've done in this uh, sensor is we've decided to highlight all the metal things in the scene. So we've shown how you can combine the various layers to do that in the sensor API. 
So now for the purposes of this demonstration, we've created another sample sensor that we can show you. So this is going to do uh, what is like a LiDAR simulation. So we'll use the sensor API to create a sensor. And as I mentioned, the sensor would be available for use on any IG camera. Uh, so in order to do this, we'll use our DX11 rendering listener API, uh, which gives us access directly to the rendering pipeline. And we'll capture the camera projection matrix. Uh, with that camera projection matrix, we will compute the inverse uh, so that it can be passed to the pixel shader. Then in the pixel shader, we'll compute the real world distance and we'll use the depth buffer and the inverse projection matrix to do that. Finally, we'll take that computed distance and map it to an RGB color for display. So now we'll go ahead and look at a quick demonstration of that. All right, so uh, initially we're looking at VBS Blue IG in the window here, and this is our normal sensor. So we'll open up our view manager and our debug UI uh, where we can interact with what sensor is currently being displayed. So currently we see the normal sensor. Now that sensor has parameters like any sensor in uh, VBS IG SDK. So we can adjust those parameters at runtime. Uh, and those sensors are programmatically available to other uh, gears components as well. So I'm just showing a simple example of how you can adjust these. So we'll collapse that. And uh, before I show the LiDAR sensor, well, let's look at the MRT debug sensor. So that picture I showed uh, just a few moments ago was uh, an example of the kinds of data layers here. Now we're seeing them live. So on the bottom right hand corner, we have a material sensor. Some of these others are showing lighting and normals and things like this. So there's a way of actually seeing this. And this is just a simple sensor to demonstrate that. So now we'll switch to our LiDAR example sensor, which is the one that we built for this. So we'll go ahead and activate that. And uh, notice that we're seeing now depth. So we can move around a little bit and see the, the colors change as I get closer or further from things. And as I get lower to the ground, I have that darker red color. Uh, as we move up, it gets lighter. And in the farther distance, we have the yellow, green, and blue. And so we'll just move around here just to show that. We'll get back down. And so basically that's a simple uh, visual representation of kind of like mapping LiDAR to an RGB color. So we'll go ahead and turn that sensor back off. And we'll come over here to Gear Studio to look at how this was built. So if we go to the edit, we can see which APIs we had to use. In this case, we are using the sensor aspect API and the render target aspect API. In this case, there's actually really very few APIs from Sim SDK that we had to use. It's very simple to create this. As well, on the uh, listener side, we only needed really the DirectX 11 rendering interface listener and, and some of the, the two of the sensor APIs. So if we look at the code really quickly, um, we'll come over to the file that Gears auto-generated and we're looking at the on initialize sensor, uh, which is what Gears will call when it's ready to initialize a sensor. So here I'm just registering my sensor with the system and I gave it the name LiDAR example sensor. Um, additionally, I mentioned that we needed to grab the projection matrix and invert it. So we'll come up here and we'll have a sensor callback. So this is another callback that Gears Auto generated for us. So we'll simply compute that inverse projection matrix there so that it could be available to the shader. Here we'll be creating a sampler so we can sample depth uh, in the scene. And we'll come over and look at our actual pixel shader. And our pixel shader is doing things like sampling the depth and it takes that sample depth and, and it converts it from normalized device coordinates uh, in using the inverse uh, the projection matrix, it gets it into actual uh, depth and it does the inverse perspective divide there. And finally, it's going to take uh, the computed depth and it will uh, map it to RGB using some simple uh, linear interpolation functions. And so basically that's the uh, simple example of creating a LiDAR sensor with uh, the And uh, the, the effort for this, this was actually quite small. Uh, this was only about three man days of effort. Um, you could easily create a sensor like this yourself in less time, um, doing if, especially if you're an expert in any of the DirectX 11 techniques. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Mark. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. Okay. 
Um, so long time ago, I actually used to be a programmer, but my daily job as a advisor to the board, uh, I typically don't get any chance to do much programming anymore. So actually back in January this year, I thought let's get into it again and actually test our SDK. So for the integration example I chose, um, I chose PetSim, um, which is a microscopic pedestrian crowd simulation library. And PetSim is based on a social force model, which assumes that every agent is just affected by three different forces. So first of all, there's a desired force, which you see on the bottom, bottom left of this diagram, and that points towards the current waypoint. Um, then there's typically obstacle forces, uh, which are created by obstacles such as walls. And uh, there are social forces created by other pedestrians around the agent. So the sum of all these force vectors will then result in acceleration and over time define the direction and velocity of each pedestrian. And I'm now going to show you how that system works. So first of all, I'm going to filter my battle space here and my scenario actually takes place in San Francisco. And I'm going to switch to the editor and um, we'll then directly switch to 3D mode. And what you can see is like an overview of San Francisco. So in the distance, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. But overall, obviously, the city is quite empty by default. And we would typically use control AI entities to populate the city. However, the goal here was to demonstrate the external entity simulation. So we go in first person and actually start PetSim. This will take a while. In the background, the PetSim simulation is now starting up and spawns characters. And the characters are then spread along the sidewalks and have some basic waypoints. So for this demo, I just picked some random civilians from our extensive content library. And as you can see, the force model creates a quite natural looking collision avoidance. So each of the three forces that I presented earlier can be controlled by applying additional factors. So for example, uh, increasing the social force factor would lead to something like uh, social distancing or uh, increasing uh, applying other factors um, like the obstacles would push them further from the wall. So we will now switch to a spectator camera to show the scale of the demo itself. Overall, there are 2,500 entities in the scene and every entity is doing the force calculation in each simulation step. So the PetSim simulation is happening in its own threat and it takes about 200 milliseconds for each simulation step. So you might say, hang on, this means only five frames per second. Obviously the VBS frame rate is much higher than that. So the reason for the smooth display that you see here are the built-in interpolation and extrapolation algorithms, which can be easily toggled on and off using the API. So zooming a bit out, as you can see in this view, there are about six city blocks that are populated with our pedestrians and in the distance, there's also a park. The engine is capable of rendering this at 60 frames per second. Um, however, you might notice that my performance here is a bit lower. And this is because I'm running a debug build and later in the demo, I'll explain the reason for running this in debug build. So, just moving a little bit closer to, to show some, some other location of these pedestrians moving. So before we get into the debug topic, I would like to show you another feature uh, that I quickly experimented with. And this is like a simple fleeing behavior. Essentially, I'm just picking the waypoint that's furthest away from the threat and then have entities move towards this waypoint. Uh, in addition, obviously, the entity velocity is increased, and that leads to that running, fleeing behavior. The SDK in this example takes care of all the animations, so I really I only apply the velocities and all the animations are done. So I'm stopping the simulation now to show you a nice new feature of the Gears environment. If I bring up Gears Studio, you can see my component over here, and if I right-click and edit the component, there's a tick box for component reloading down there. This option automatically takes care of creating the entire infrastructure to unload and reload components during runtime. And I will now show you how this works. So I bring up a component menu and select my component from the list of reloadable components. I unload the component and switch over to Visual Studio. So what I'm going to do in here is I actually comment out all the classes that are not children in my simulation and I essentially rebuild uh, my solution now.
so the functionality of reloading is only available for debug components. Um, and this is the, because there's some overhead of passing function calls through a proxy stub DLL. So now I reload my component. And I'm going to start the PetSim simulation again. And this will take again about 10 seconds to initialize. Um, and, and using the system, obviously much larger code changes are actually possible. And this leads to really quick development iterations. And hopefully it works. Yep, as you can see, there are now only children in the scene. And um, this was the change of actually reloading on the fly. So to summarize, just using a few of the simulation SDK APIs, I was able to create this realistic looking uh, or port this realistic looking entity uh, simulation system. Let's switch back to the slides. Yeah, so here's another overview. It actually shows the uh, APIs I was using to create the system. And the overall development days was just four days. Um, so there's a lot of things that could be refined. Um, there, there would be ways to optimize Petsim a lot more based on the current camera location and something like this. But it was really just to get this integration thing done. So I will now hand over to Tim to talk about XR. Hi guys, I'm Tim Tursich. I'm an XR engineer at Bison. And I'm gonna emphasize today the importance of connecting the IG to the real world. And so what we've been emphasizing is to take the VBS Blue product and create better MR mixed reality applications or support better mixed reality. And this is done by better connecting the IG to tracking IO, and better supporting the SDK with tracking device support, as well as biometric sensors that various simulations or training might want to take advantage of. And so let's play a short clip of some basic connection here. So this is the uh, VBS Blue renderer, and it's being composited in, um, in an augmented reality uh, style, mixed reality style, and it's connected via tracking so that there is a one-to-one -one, uh, tracking correlation and basically it's achieved a portal-like effect looking into our virtual rendering. And so real quick, um, I just want to talk about the spectrum of uh, what XR capabilities uh, really represent. Uh, this is a spectrum where on one end you have purely immersive virtual reality. Uh, and on the other, you have more of a augmented, composited, augmented reality. And really all of these applications count as a mixed reality, but emphasize one end of the spectrum more than the other. And so first off, just talking about the more immersive virtual reality, we basically have support for the array of possible off-the-shelf controllers that you can uh, imagine. So basically, uh, HTC Vive, uh, Valve Index, uh, Microsoft Mixed Reality, Oculus controllers all work um, out of box. And uh, of course, there are other sensors in some of the HMDs out there, such as eye tracking. And of course, being able to better deliver these controllers and sensors, all of this is supported in the SDK support that we provide. So talking specifically about creating applications with the proper modern hardware support, we really emphasize a lot of enterprise level uh, HMDs. Uh, one such uh, HMD is the Vario VR1, where this is uh, what a lot of people think is necessary for doing foveated uh, with a high resolution inset to be able to better read uh, a writing uh, in virtual reality or be able to see very far distant objects. Uh, sometimes applications uh, demand a wide field of view. And another enterprise headset that uh, takes on that challenge is the VR engineers XDAL HMD, which has up to a 170 degree field of view. And then sometimes applications have a cost effective need or they want to uh, uh, take advantage of an HMD that kind of does a lot of things well, uh, which is uh, what where the Valve Index usually slots in. And then as I mentioned before, 
biometric sensors may be emphasized with various uh, enterprise level HMDs. And one such HMD is the Vipro I that brings eye tracking uh, to the field where you would be able to uh, completely know what objects somebody was looking at inside the virtual reality environment without them actually needing to turn their head, for instance. Moving over to uh, mixed reality or, or more uh, focused on blending the virtual and the real world, uh, basically uh, somewhere in between, uh, we want a certain amount of the virtual and a certain amount of the real world. But the purpose um, with some of the things we've been working with is to connect that real world environment more so over to real um, hand related interfaces or closer related to real world interfaces that somebody would be using in, for instance, training. So. Uh, mixed reality masking alignment for cockpits is one such feature that we've been doing with the Vario XR1. Uh, this is done with the uh, uh, cockpit masking alignment algorithm that allows us to easily be able to connect a real world cockpit trainer directly into our virtual uh, 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 cockpits of various uh, 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 planes and vehicles uh, that you'd be capable of doing that with. Um, and then on the other side is tracking integrated with uh, projector related systems. So for instance, um, we've been able to achieve custom Steam VR tracking um, and correlate to projectors for various things like firearms um, and be able to actually align the actual training emphasis uh, that people are trying to achieve in that regard. And so here is a demonstration of the uh, simulator that we put on the ITSEC floor in 2019. Um, this is an Apache uh, pilot training simulator. And so basically, uh, one of the key things that uh, the training is now capable of is being able to see things like the MFDs interact with the custom buttons on MFDs, uh, see the joystick, see the internals of the actual uh, uh, physical cockpit trainers uh, that are often designed for various aircraft. to the other side of the spectrum, uh, we're gonna talk about augmented reality. And so basically what we've been emphasizing in the uh, blue product renderer is the ability to properly mix real world images with virtual ones. This is much more detailed than just compositing or overlaying virtual images onto cameras uh, that are integrated into the IG. Um, but what we've been doing is we've been adding depth and detection to the real world circumstances that are coming in through cameras and video images into the IG. So um, we leverage finer control uh, for rendering for things like terrain, trees, foliage, water, objects, and particles to better know if they're, for instance, behind objects. Uh, that are in the camera or to properly blend them on top of the real world images. And so um, now we're going to see a video of uh, uh, Close Air Solutions and their Hyperreal initiative um, where they've been taking advantage of these render capabilities. And so what they do is they do a JTAC solution where they take a real van with their uh, AR style training and uh, basically they overlay various things and composite various things with our IG. And so if you take a look at here, this is a real world building that has shadows being cast onto the actual virtual vehicle here. And other uh, effects like uh, bombs and smoke are, are being achieved um, in this scenario as well as surface to air missile launches that they uh, use the IG to achieve. And so um, this is just a really cool example of be us being able to take our 
uh, real world renderer, our, our whole earth renderer, and connect it and align it to the camera images on a real place on the planet earth. And uh, you can see that this is achieving a, a really, really, really cool uh, visualization. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Ryan uh, to go over some more SDK related features. Sure, uh, so just final word about the, the SDKs themselves. Uh, they ship with uh, quite a number of samples which are, are very useful, uh, both VBSIG and VBS uh, simulation SDKs. They have uh, quite a many examples and documentation to help you get started. Uh, and lots more. And next, I will hand it to Julian to talk about our improved content pipeline. Yes, I would like to take a quick look at the content side of customizing your VBS. And before we go looking at VBS4, I'd like to circle back and provide a view at the VBS3 asset workflow to just add a refresher before we consider what is new. In the beginning, let's say you have to put a tank into VBS3. You would start by either acquiring the 3D model from a vendor, a marketplace, or have an artist created in a dedicated content creation tool. Uh, industry standard tools would be 3ds Max, Maya, Modo, and Blender. When you have created such a model, a tank, you send it as an FBX file format to model converter which then converts it to P3D, which is our proprietary file format. And that is then handled by Oxygen2, which is our, also a proprietary software that we use to uh, set up the model, the mesh to be VBS ready. This is where we make the wheels be it identified as a wheel, where we say, this is the turret, this is the barrel of a turret. And we also assign textures. So the, the, essentially the meat of the content creation is being done in Oxygen 2. This causes a slight disconnect in sources that uh, any given company will have between the source that is VBS ready, the P3D file, and the source that is embedded in uh, any of the dedicated tools that you use to create the model. Uh, once you have this created and the mesh has been made suitable through Oxygen 2, through a lot of manual labor, you then pass it to the manual config setup where you decide how should it sound, how fast should it go, what ammo should it carry, equipment, all these details for the simulation. Once these two pieces are assembled, you merge them together through add-on packer and send them to VBS3. Now, for VBS4, we have simplified this process. You still have your known source on the left side where you created an industry standard tool. You send it to model exchanger that is the new tool that we are introducing. And from Model Exchanger, which handles all the content setup in conjunction with the industry standard tool, gets then sent through the add-on packer to VBS4. Now, let's have a closer look. Model Exchanger's purpose is twofold. The first is to make an extendable platform for future use that can be also uh, expanded by third-party customers. And the second point is to reduce the time spent on asset development. Some of these features of how we achieve this is by enabling you to generate a level of detail very quickly, very fast using the SimpliGon technology to abstract and simplify the VBS model setup and also to get rid of this P3D source split that I mentioned earlier by moving all the work to the industry standard tool that you or your company or whoever is working on this is already familiar with. You no longer have to spend some time to learn and get up to date with our side of the tools. This means you can also hire from a worldwide talent pool. Then the 3D mesh manipulation, it's a C-sharp script engine that allows you to do pretty much any of the automated tasks that you may be familiar already from the VBS3's O2 script. This is now essentially upgraded to the next generation using a commonly understood script language. You don't have now to learn our own version, our own solution for this anymore. Uh, Model Exchanger also supports about 50 file formats, including classics like Filmbox, FBX, 
uh, Collada, 3DS, Blender file format, GLTF, we're looking a bit into the future here, and also a few past file, file formats like uh, object or model. These might be file formats that you have from legacy content lying around and you want to access them. Model Exchanger will still allow you to do that then. And of course, command line integration, any kind of automation, any operation that doesn't require a GUI can be done without a GUI, a graphical user interface. Now, how does an artist or a content developer interface with Model Exchanger? This is essentially the new workflow. You still have your artist creating the models, the textures, materials, even animations for the vehicle in the tool that they are most familiar with. Once that is done, this is being sent as probably FBX or any of the other file formats to Model Exchanger, where we then perform a compatibility check that tells you what is actually suitable for this model uh, to be sent to VBS or not. Let's say you still have this tank that you want to import, but you didn't define the tracks and the wheels. Model Exchanger will tell you about this and say, hey, you've missing some, some wheels. This feedback is reported back to you, so you can make the changes in the tool that you're familiar with and have a single source of truth, a single source file. We no longer have your, your, your Max project file and P3D. We have both, we have only the Max file now as the, the, the source. Once the change is made, you send it back to Model Exchanger, you run the check again. It says, yes, everything is awesome. We can send it to P3D and send it to VBS. Now, the compatibility check. In detail, this is a graphical user interface. You pipe in your model, you just drag and drop it, and you select the asset category. In this case, a, for example, a tank. And it would then perform all the relevant checkup scripts for it for you. You can customize which ones you run and which ones you want to ignore. What this does here is essentially abstract this, I like to refer to it as a bit of an arcane knowledge, of the model pipeline, the model setup that was involved in the process for VBS3, and it abstracts it into this tool for you. So you don't have to learn and know all about this. It just tells you what you are missing. One, for example, one good example of this is, let's say you have imported a model and it references a texture that has in its path a special character that is invalid or not allowed in VBS. You would then continue with this mesh normally and there would be a crash, a bug, something would not happen correctly in the simulation and you'd be wondering why. And it would be far down the list of things to investigate to see if your file names are legit. Model Exchanger is kind of like a watchdog and it keeps an eye for, for this uh, out for you and tells you if something is not up. This is how you save headaches and confusion. Also, I should notice that any of these scripts here that can be performed and run, are customizable through C-sharp, I mentioned it earlier. So you can create your own tools, your own checks, your own automations here. There's also a, a uh, option to allow some instant fixes. For example, a, a, if you pipe in a texture name or a selection name that is too long, this would also cause an overflow in the engine and it would just truncate it for you without having you to go back to Max and re-import the source file, which you still should do because your sources should be the single source of truth. But for a quick go, this is fine. I mentioned also that on the slide earlier that there is a lot generation. For that, I should briefly talk about the concept of a level of detail. All VBS assets do have level of details. You can see here on the left side, we have a character that is fairly detailed. And on the right side, as the cascades down, we have simpler and simplified uh, uh, variants of the same mesh. This allows us to render more and more units in the scene without draining performance. Customer content usually, in my experience, doesn't really have LODs because it's a, a bit of an unfamiliar concept. It's also a lot of work to do. What we have done is we have integrated the SimpliGon technology to allow you to design and generate these LODs through automation. So you just have to say what should be the target and it puts out a lot for you or a set of lots for you. I should mention this is a third party integration of the SimpliGon technology, which is easy and free to license. Another such automation to help you import content a bit quicker and a bit less complex is the convex hull generator. For those of you who are familiar with content for VBS, you always have to generate a so-called geometry lot that allows it to 
easily calculate collisions between vehicles. This shape needs to approximate the original visual high detail mesh as simply as possible. That usually requires a lot of manual work to approximate the shape and, and shimmy some boxes in the right place. What we have done here is a tool that within five or 10 seconds generates the mesh you see on the right hand side. That's very crude looking, but still very helicopter like uh, shape from the one that you see on the left. Now let's have a quick outlook at what we else have planned for Model Exchanger. We would like to uh, we would like to provide a model converter plugin. This allows you to leverage all the the uh, 50 plus file formats as import, also to allow you to export them. Uh, this should be in FBX and P3D at a minimum. And also, we would like to introduce the add-on packing straight into Model Exchanger. At this point, it's a separate tool on the side that can be uh, accessed and works at this time. The big takeaway here is that the Model Exchanger, the summary of it is, is really it cuts development time by 50 to 60 percent. And uh, you, can, you can now use the industry standard tools and you can reach out to the talent pool that is actually out there without requiring knowledge or training of VBS proprietary software. So this is really a big step change. Um, compared to the uh, original system that we had in VBS3. Excellent, Julian. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. And I will now hand over to Jurai, who represents a company called Logica from the Ukraine. Hello, Jurai. Uh, Logica is yeah. very innovative uh, simulators based on VBS systems for the Ukrainian army. And uh, he will give us a short introduction what his company achieved using VBS. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, indeed, uh, it happens that in recent years, Ukrainian army had mm, in great need for great variety of simulators. Everything was needed, from simple firearm simulator to sophisticated crew simulators for full mission training of anti-aircraft crews and armored vehicle crews. And luckily, Luckily, we had uh, Bohemia uh, as our partners and VBS and VBS SDK as great tools to help us with, us, with our efforts to do these simulators. Uh, today, I'm going to tell about two use cases, two big use cases that we use VBS SDK for and show you what we achieve. Please, next slide. So first uh, case is in integration with hardware. So we, as a company, provides software and hardware solutions. So it's all involved solution. And it happens that, as uh, previous speaker already been told before, that mixed reality simulators are quite effective and um, quite cost effective and fast to develop. That's very important for Ukrainian army. You have to be able to deliver product in just a few months. Uh, so we done such simulator uh, for mortar training. Uh, next slide, please. That's what mortar simulator is look like. You see the real mortar attached with uh, replicas of mortar barrel. That's uh, black barrel inside the green barrel. Green barrel is real mortar, a black barrel is replica. And uh, optical side, you see this black box, uh, it's optical side. And mine also is replica. So we get this real mortar, put it in front of uh, projector with VBS and attach HTC VR trackers to the optical uh, replica and the barrel. And actually, that is, uh, you have the training simulator. Next, please show video how it works. That is actually so uh, you could uh, done great things with VBS and VBS SDK. And I have to mention that we've been able to deliver this 
mortar simulators in just like um, I think one and a half months to deliver the alpha version of product and it took two more additional months to deliver fully working product and currently it's uh, in actively in use. Uh, again, we use a lot of VBS SDK functionality. It's uh, like Mission API, Vault API, uh, Transformation API, etc. So almost every API that's uh, inside VBS SDK, we have been used heavily. Another example of our usage of VBS SDK integration with hardware sensor and companies is uh, firearms training range simulator. You see this cabin where infantrymen trainee have different kind of weapons, uh, weapons replicas, and these replicas uh, and helmet of the trainee are um, combined with uh, HTC trackers, similar to previous mortar simulator. Trainee could move inside this uh, cabin, could fire weapons, and now please show the video we could see some interesting effects that could be achieved using mixed reality what mixed reality could allow us so you see the train he is moving inside its cabin and uh, dynamic field of view because it's attached to the helmet so it's actually moving and from the point of view of training he could uh, hide behind the opticals, he could fire in different position and the tracker will track position of training and automatically inside VBS this position will be changed as well. So it's either standing, uh, lying, crouching or kneeling. And um, also there are uh, like small joystick on the weapon that it could use to move inside VBS world. So it's an example of mixed reality uh, that combine physical weapon replicas and uh, uh, VBS world using VBS SDK and RTC trackers. And again, it's we seem it's like quite cost and time effective solution. So we've done it this like in a couple of months and two more months to finalize this product. So Again, it's currently actively in use. So next, uh, our case is custom optics library. As as I tell, we have been doing a lot of armored vehicle simulation, and these vehicles require quite sophisticated optics sites and different uh, instruments to work with. And for this reason, we again used VBS SDK to make this as real and as fiddle as possible. So next slide. That's what I'm talking about. You see the side of beam one, you see this uh, grid, it could move, depends on action of training, of crew. Um, and we could see the video, please show the next slide. Uh, it will be the T-72 uh, gunner site. And you see it's dynamic. So this grid moving, it's uh, integrated heavily with uh, hardware and uh, additional components. So that's what we have done with VBS SDK. Again, timing was very good using VBS SDK. I think we been uh, this BMP one side. We've been able to achieve some early prototype, like in few weeks, like two or three weeks, and later in few months we achieve the high fidelity that uh, needed for customer. So actually, that's my story. Thank for the opportunity to tell you about this. So we achieved quite a lot of success with VBS products. All right, so um, that's it. Uh, we will answer your questions in a moment. Uh, if, if you have additional questions, please please list them here in the chat window. Uh, I hope we did present enough to catch your interest in using VR Sims technology. You heard about gears, uh, the SDK and tools. Uh, I apologize for uh, the little hiccup that happened there. Um, as, as Pete mentioned, there will be a recording available uh, from the session this morning. Uh, but um, I'm also happy to announce that Julian seems to be back now, so he can still answer any questions you might have about the model development. So um, you heard about these, um, and it is important that they combine 
to create a very effective way of uh, a development environment. And I would also like to thank Yuri and Close Air Support for allowing us to, to highlight their projects, uh, showing how quickly high quality solutions can be built on our platform. And um, overall, we might not be able to get all of you to all of your questions. So I encourage you to engage with us uh, to explore technology. Um, and uh, I'm sure it could help you in achieving your specific projects pipeline.